I am especially interested to hear what we can do to raise the level of trust among our police officers and citizens while still protecting both. Policing will never be an easy or safe job, but I believe we must do everything we can to ensure that our officers have the tools and training they need to protect themselves and our nation's citizens. I'd also like to thank the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, the ranking member, uh, for working with us so closely uh, to arrange this hearing. Uh, and I was also inspired by the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, uh, who has been speaking with me for some time uh, about uh, this issue. And I thank them both. And I recognize the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much. And let me thank both you and uh, the ranking member, my ranking member, uh, for uh, listening and engaging and leading. And I was delighted to participate in the process. And uh, I'd like to say to my colleagues uh, that this effort of criminal justice reform is going to be a committee effort. Every member's input and assessment uh, and analysis and uh, legislative initiatives will stand equal, I believe, in the eyes of the ranking member and the chairman, and certainly those of us who serve as the chairperson and ranking member of the Crime Subcommittee, as I do. Uh, America will not be responded to unless this committee works together, uh, and that uh, our efforts are in unison uh, and collective, responding, of course, to the many witnesses that will come before us. So this is the first year. And I think America should recognize the very large step that we are making. Uh, Sheriff Clark, let me thank you for your service. Uh, we may agree to disagree, but there is no uh, disagreement uh, with your service and the sacrifice that you represent. As you indicated, we met a couple of weeks ago. Uh, just May 15th, I was on the um, west uh, side of the campus of this great Congress. Uh, dealing with the many families uh, who had lost loved ones uh, in law enforcement. So my tone today will be that we do ill when we take each other's pain lightly. The pain of Black Lives Matter, the pain of hands up, don't shoot, that pain of uh, I can't breathe, that is pain. Uh, and it is equally the pain of Mr. Greer who was on the steps of his house August 2013 and was shot in Virginia. He happened to be a Anglo or Caucasian male. What we have to do to make a legislative step of monumental change that gives our officers the confidence of their work, further enhance their training, is to be able to work together. My line of questioning will be how do we fix uh, these problems uh, and how do we get uh, the 5% number, that is a lot of officers, to be 25%, 50% accreditation? That's what the American people, I think, are looking at. I don't want anyone's pain to be diminished, and I sit here today recognizing that pain. So let me just quickly uh, say this regarding statistics. James Coney, the director of FBI, said the following about the Uniform Crime Report. The now three-year-old source uh, that was cited uh, in the sheriff's testimony, said the following, demographic data regarding officer-involved shootings is not consistently reported to us through our uniform crime reporting program. Because reporting is voluntary, our data is incomplete and therefore in the aggregate unreliable. Mr. Hartley, uh, I have um, thought that data is important. Introduced a bill called the Cadet Bill to gather statistics on shootings by police and by individuals against police, because I believe in fairness. And so, if this was required, would that be an asset uh, to Kalia as you do your scientific work of providing insight for training? Ms. Jackson Lee, let me yeah. tell you that. Microphone. Uh, is your mic on? Sorry about that. Ms. Jackson Lee, uh, let me first start by saying that I think data helps drive decision making and it helps drive it in an important way because you don't know what you don't know uh, sometimes. And what we find is organizations that engage with Kalia and accreditation discover data during the process that really helps them make fundamental decisions that drive the organization in a responsible way towards community service. Do you have enough money to accredit all of the uh, police departments across America? Would you need some incentivizing, some funding to help you do that? 
Well, <clears throat> we don't need the incentivizing or funding to help that occur, but those organizations sometimes do. Uh, organizations that participate with us range in size from 10,000 to 10. So, so funding to them would be a helpful component of police uh, accountability? I think that would support agencies Let, in this mission. Got a series of questions. On the CALEA standards on body cameras, police arrests and transport, an independent review of use of le lethal force by law enforcement, are there standards? That's the question. On body cameras, police arrests and transport. One of the issues that I'm now concerned about because when the issue came out in Baltimore, it wasn't uh, sort of put aside, police departments were saying all over, you know what, that's some of the things that we do. But do you have standards on that and use of lethal force? Uh, we do have standards on all those subjects. The one related to transport didn't particularly address the issue that was faced in Baltimore. However, there is a, a standard that encourages the safe transport of individuals regardless of the type but of... But we need to help enhance that and make that a noticeable part of policing across America. Well, I think that the standards themselves are a dynamic living tool, and I think as we encounter new issues, and we certainly will, we have to be prepared to make those adjustments in our standards to address those issues. Could I quickly ask you, Ms. Ra, you have written about the obstacles of implementing changes in training programs, particularly opposition from those wedded to the status quo. Can you explain that, and can you also add to your conversation, uh, I don't want any police officer to not go home to their family. That's the mantra that we all stand by. And I, you know, everyone would say, we have great relationships. I'm a big believer in community-oriented policing. The father of community-oriented policing lives in Houston, Lee Brown. Uh, but could you comment on that and then the idea of de-escalation in training and how that impacts uh, time of, on a police interaction? Time of the gentlewoman has expired. The witness will be allowed to answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a very exciting hearing that uh, generates a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I have described the philosophical shift that I have been promoting for a couple of years as, as moving our culture closer to a guardian mentality rather than a warrior mentality. I believe the warrior mentality was a result of a political movement that started in the 60s when we declared war on crime, war on drugs, war on all sorts of things. The police agencies across this nation responded as they do to their political leadership in their communities. What I'm trying to do is help our new police officers find the right balance because officers absolutely must have keen warrior skills and they must be able to use them without hesitation or policy. But I want them to consider their role within our democracy and that role needs to be the role of a protector with the goal of protecting people rather than conquering them. When you try to initiate this type of a mindset shift, there is naturally going to be resistance. The greatest resistance I've encountered is just the misunderstanding of what I'm, what I'm talking about. When I have the opportunity to explain it in more depth, most officers will say to me, that's how good cop cops have always done it. I want our recruits on their first day on the street to have the wisdom of a good cop with 20 years experience. Thank Time you. of the gentlewoman yes. has expired. Thank the you. chair recognizes the gentleman. Um, may I, in, in unanimous consent, just uh, say one or two points, Mr. Chairman, is on this committee. First of all, uh, let me ask the chairman to have unanimous consent to enter into the record the following documents, a statement and testimony from the American Civil Liberties Union, a statement from the National Urban League, Executive Order 13688, which provides federal standards for acquisition of military equipment, a letter from um, Mr. Um, Conyers, Mr. Scott, Mr. Cohen, requesting a hearing in 2014, uh, excuse me, I guess it's from myself, <laughs> from myself, Mr. Scott, Mr. Cohen, I'm sorry, Mr. Scott, Mr. Cohen, uh, and Mr. Conyers, and then, um, a article entitled Law Enforcement Warrior Problem um, to be added into the record. Mr. Without objection. And then, Mr. Chairman, if I might, just in thanking the witnesses, just make one uh, uh, simple uh, comment. And, and that is, I want to express to all of you the significance of your testimony and that the Judiciary Committee, uh, through our chairman and ranking member and those of us who work on these issues, are very serious about coming forward in the spirit of recognizing uh, the pain of an officer's death uh, and the pain of a civilian's confusion and apprehension about police and maybe even their death. And I frankly believe we can find that common ground. 
I hope that you will allow us to inquire of you. We did not get to question everyone. I hope that you will make yourself resources as we write forward uh, to address a mother's pain uh, and as well find that even place. And I, I end my remarks by quoting um, a philosopher, Joanne Van Gogh, treat people as, as if they were what they should be and you help them become what they're capable of being. Justice Hand said, if we are to keep our democracy, there must be one commandment. And Sheriff Clark, I think this is what you're speaking of. Thou shall not ration justice. Everyone deserves justice. Uh, and we do not deny your officers justice. And we've got to let the civilian population, no matter who they are, know that they will get justice. That is what this committee's purpose is. And I hope that we will have some more provocative hearings maybe those who've lost loved ones, maybe the young people who are raising the signs because of their passion of Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, hands up, don't shoot, and as well, I can't breathe. Let's give all of those persons dignity. And this hearing has been one to give all of us hearing, including uh, Sheriff, all of the men and women that you represent and you have represented them. I yield back to the chairman. General